Okay, so for this tutorial, we're going to be using ScanP. It's pretty much the go-to single cell analysis package if you want to do this in Python. So we just need ScanP, pandas, and numpy. And then later when we do the clustering, you'll need to have these installed as well. So ScanP is becoming a very popular tool. I see more and more often nature and cell papers using ScanP. It's pretty similar to Surat, but it's in Python, which in my opinion makes it 10 times better. And it's also faster than Surat, especially on big data sets. And it integrates better with machine learning because machine learning is more developed in Python than in R. The ScanP Read the Docs does have a nice introduction that you can follow along with, but I will explain things that I think are important, and I also change a few things. Alright, so I'm going to continue with the data we had processed in my 10x Cell Ranger video. We had produced output files in a folder called Tutorial Sample because we used the ID flag Tutorial Sample. And I ran this Jupyter Notebook inside the same directory that Tutorial Sample's in. ScanP can read a bunch of different formats, but in this case I'm just reading the matrix files. So if we look actually at this. So we just point to this directory here and inside it has barcodes, features, and matrix. But you could just read the H5 matrix directly. But anyways, let's read in this data. And if we look at it, we see that we have 8,800 cells, and it was a human genome with 36,000 different features. So let's just quickly go through the pre-processing. I don't change too much from the read the docs here. The first thing we do is we want to get rid of cells with fewer than 200 genes, and then we want to get rid of genes that are found in fewer than three cells. So if we look at it now, we see we only have 21,000 genes now. But anyways, okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to label the genes that are mitochondrial genes. So if we look at a data that far now, here's just the gene IDs and the number of cells in them, but we want to find all the var names. So these are the var names, the index of this. And we want to find all of them that start with MT. And in the human data set, they do start with a capital MT. But if you're doing mouse, I think they start with a lowercase MT. But depending on what you're doing, just double check that MT capitalized is actually what your data set uses. So now if we look at this, we see that it added a column of just true and false of whether they're a mitochondrial gene. And then we can check here. So if we just look at that, at only the true rows, we see that we do have labeled genes. So if you didn't see anything here, that's when you would worry. Okay, so the next thing, we just want to use this calculate QC metrics. And if we look at the A data now, see it just adds a bunch of columns to the observation object. So before I ran this, it would have only been the index with the barcodes. And then we can plot this. And we can see that this data set had a pretty nice distribution. So now we can plot a scatter plot of the total counts by the percent mitochondrial counts and the number of gene counts. Again, it's just a way to make sure your data set looks okay, but it gives you an idea where you filter out outliers. But Instead of just picking based on graphs, what I normally do is use a quantile instead of arbitrarily picking a value. Uh, for example, here I'm just using numpy quantile of all the genes by count values, setting it to the 98th percent quantile for an upper limit and then a lower limit at 2%. How they have you do it in the tutorial is you just look at the chart. So I'm just going to get an upper limit and a lower limit and print it out. So I'm going to keep all the data 
that's between 320 and 6,700. And the A data is really easy to filter. You can filter it just like a data frame and pandas. So if, again, if we look at a data.obs, we see it's just a pandas data frame and you can filter it, the whole a data object, just like you would filter a pandas data frame. So for example, let's say for some reason I wanted to only keep this, I could just say obs.index and look, now we only have one cell and it filters everything. So it's really easy to filter the scan p object. And what we're doing here is I'm just filtering on the upper limit we just made and the lower limit. And then also here, since the mitochondrial counts are around five to 10-ish percent, I'll just cut off at 20. So we're gonna throw away all the cells that are up here. And we just, again, do a really simple filtering. Uh, you don't even need this, get rid of this. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is now we're gonna normalize every cell to 10,000 counts so that you can actually compare between cells. So let me just take this opportunity to show you how to access the raw data or the counts. So you can call .x to look at the counts. It stores it as a sparse matrix, but you can still call individual columns or rows. So let's just call the first row and then all the genes. You see we have a matrix that's only one by 21,000. So this is all the values for one individual cell. And if we do a sum here, we see that it's 8,900. And just as another example, let's pick the second cell and we see that it's 26,000. So all the UMI counts for this cell added up to 26,000. But when we run this, now let's take the same sum you see that it's now 10,000 instead of 26,000. And if we check zero, it's 10,000 instead of the 8,000 or whatever it was. And then finally, we wanna change all the counts from UMI counts to log counts. And that's basically it for the pre-processing. Now for the clustering, if you're familiar with Surat, it's pretty similar. We're just gonna find the highly variable genes and these are just the default values, but I put them here anyways. So what this did, all it did, just like the mitochondrial labeling, what it did was in the VARs, so the data frame that contain, contains the gene information, it just put a false or a true for highly variable. So if we look at only the highly variable genes, the ones that have true in that column, you can see that there are 4,190 highly variable genes. And then now, before we do any more filtering or processing, we're gonna save the raw data as the current object. So this just makes a new slot called .raw. And the A data and nothing we do further will change the raw data, but you can call it back at any time. And now we're just gonna filter out all of the genes that aren't highly variable. So now if we look at the A data, we have 7,900 cells, but only 4,100 genes. But if you look at the raw, you see that it still has all 21,000 genes. And you can convert this back to a regular A data object really easily too. So next we're gonna call this function regress out to correct for effects due to total counts per cell and mitochondrial counts. So this might take a little while. All right, and then we're gonna scale each gene to the unit variance. And then let me just show you. So now you see we have negative values in the counts table. But if we look at the raw, you see we never go below zero. Okay, so next we're gonna calculate the PCAs, just like you would in Surat. And then let's just plot those. So here, it's just showing how the PCs are actually contributing to the variance. So you can use this to kind of decide how many PCs to use in your clustering. The number of PCs 
think even Surratt said so in one of their papers, really doesn't make that big of a difference overall. But obviously you want to pick one of the PCs as a cutoff up here. You want to pick when they start flattening out. So you could pick about 20, but again, if you picked 30, the actual difference wouldn't be that much. Um, so actually for this, I just picked 20. So we're going to compute the neighbors using 20 PCs. And then finally, we can calculate the UMAP. And then we can plot the UMAP. So this data set actually only has one cell type. That's why we don't see distinct clustering. We were curious to see how cells that were positive for Zika virus differed from cells that were negative from Zika virus. We haven't calculated clusters yet, so let's use the Leyden algorithm. You could use Lovain instead if you wanted to. You just call Lovain here, but let's calculate that. And then we're plotting the UMAP again by using the Leyden color. I know this is only one cell type, so I wouldn't expect 10 clusters. So I'm going to change the resolution on this actually. I'm just going to set it to 0.25. All right, this looks better. And then next, let's just find the marker genes for these different clusters. And for ScanP, it's just this rank genes group function. And we're just passing the A data. And then we're going to base the groups based on the cluster number. And we're going to use the Wilcoxon method. And then we're just going to plot this, the top 25 genes for each cluster. So here we just see the top 25 genes of any given cluster versus the rest of the cells. Here, interestingly, we see cluster four seems to be a very heavily infected cluster because in my reference genome I actually included the Zika genome as well so that we could see which cells were actually infected. We could actually look at that here too if we added Zika. So yeah, we see cluster four here, the purple one, is enriched for Zika as well. So one more thing I want to point out, because the tutorial doesn't go that much into detail with it, they do show you how to make a data frame from this, but it's not really the data frame you want. So let me just show you this function adds a dictionary under the UNS. If we look at that, we have actually the default name is actually rake genes group. So this is the data or the output from this function call here. So this is the one thing that's unfortunate. So they don't have a very simple way to convert this into a data frame, at least that I know of. But what you can do is this is just a dictionary of dictionaries. So if you come here and you say names, and then you can specify which cluster. It gives you all the genes. Or the scores, or the p-values, the p-values adjusted, and the log fold change. So you can get all this information out of here and make your own data frame. Let me just show you the function that I use to do that. All right, so it looks like a lot. Um, let's just save this as the results. So now if we do results, name zero, you see it's the same thing. So what I'm doing here is just pulling out, I need to assign groups. Groups can just be results name dot d type dot names. If we look at this, it should just be zero through four. Yeah, so we're just gonna loop over from zero to four and then pull out the names, the scores, the p-values adjusted, and the log fold changes. And then we're also just making another array that's just the group name times the length of the data. So we're just stacking all these one by however many thousand arrays and then we're transposing it so it's a five column array and then we're just appending it over and over to out. So now if we look at out we see that it's 109,000 rows and five columns 
And then we can just use pandas to put that as a data frame. And we'll just say out. Of course, we don't care about this row here, so just one to the rest of it. And then we'll call it columns, gene, scores, pval, adjusted, and then log full change. Well, and which cluster it came from. All right, so now we have a marker data frame. And we can filter this. Let's do uh, markers and then the p-value adjusted less than 0 0.05. And then actually let's take the absolute value of markers dot log full change. Let's say we want that to be greater than one. All right, so now only 7,000 genes. And then we can look at specific clusters if you wanted to. So markers dot cluster. Let's say, and these are strings, they're not ends. Um, let's try four, because that had the Zika in it. Yep, here we see cluster four, and the genes enriched in cluster four. Okay, I just want to show you one more thing that I think is important. I kind of showed you how to access cell individual cell data earlier from the object, but let's label every cell that's positive for Zika. Um, of course, your data set might not have a virus in it, but maybe you're interested in an in individual gene. This is an important technique to know when working with these scanp a data objects. Okay, so we have a data dot raw and then var names. So here are all 21,000 genes. We can use a numpy.where and then pass this and ask it where it equals Zika and it returns this and we need to get the number out by itself so we need to pass two zeros and now it's just an integer so let's just call this the Zika index and then we can from the a data dot raw so we're just going to do dot x and since it's a sparse matrix we just want to call to array and then we want to get all the values in this column. So now we have an array that's 7,900 cells. So you have a Zika value for every cell. And let's just save this as an array. And then again, if you look at the obs, you can just add any column to it just like you would a pandas data frame. It's super convenient and easy. So let's just make a new column called Zika and you can just add this to it. Now if you look at this, we have a column called Zika and it has the values for each individual cell. Now you could do something simple like filtering by Zika dot Zika, you could say, okay, greater than zero. And we see that we have 3,300 cells that are positive for Zika. And then let's just plot some violin plots. Um, the ScanP, ScanP has a bunch of different plotting functions. If you look on their website, depending on what you want to do, they probably have what you're looking for. Let's just plot Zika here and group by the cluster. Oh, just kidding. It's because I saved Zika and I should have saved this with a capital Z. But this works for, like, that's why I was yelling at me because Zika is in the gene list as well. So you don't need this to be in the observation data frame. You can call individual genes. 
like I don't have CDK. It's probably capital because it's human. Anyways, this should be enough to get you started.